Hello, my name is Michael Carbonell and I'm currently an F2 doctor at St Peter's Hospital. Today I'll be talking about abdominal x-rays. So we're going to talk about when to order and when not to order an abdo x-ray and within that the limitations of it as an investigation. We'll have a look at normal gas patterns within the abdo x-ray and then we're going to talk about some life-threatening pathologies that shouldn't be missed. We'll also discuss some other pathologies that can be seen on abdo x-rays and also some common medical devices that can show up. So when should we be doing abdo x-rays? Well, it's important to realise that an abdo x-ray isn't an insignificant radiation dose. It's quite a lot more than a chest x-ray alone and actually not too far off a CT, which is important when you think that Often you will go on to do a CT after an abdo x-ray because if an abdo x-ray shows nothing that's not enough to rule something out and if there's clinical suspicion you need a better imaging modality and if an abdo x-ray is positive for pathology you'll want to do a CT to go and further quantify that. It's also not a very sensitive examination as it says at the bottom a clinical examination in abdo x-ray only has a sensitivity of 56% and when you do a CT on top of that you're increasing the sensitivity drastically. However abdominal x-rays are done relatively frequently still and therefore it's important to have an approach when presented with one. This is taken from Radiopedia and uses an abdo x mnemonic. So A is for air is this normally distributed or is there an aberrant distribution of gas in the abdomen? B for bowel, uh, is, is it of normal size? Is its position normal? Does it look malrotated? And is the wall a normal thickness? D for dense structures, looking at stones and bones, as well as calcified organs. O for organs, and whilst an abdo film isn't very good for looking at soft tissue pathology, it can be useful to know where the organs lie. An X for external objects such as lines, drains, and also some artifacts that can be seen on abdo x-ray and can complicate interpretation. On the adequacy of the film presented to you, and it's very similar things that you're looking for as you look for in chest x-rays, but in different ways. So look for rotation. You want to look at the ribs, the iliac crests, and the obturator foramina, and they should all appear symmetrical. Penetration, you want to be able to see the outlines of each of the vertebral bodies behind the abdominal organs. And picture, you want to be able to see both lateral abdominal walls, the xiphus sternum and the inferior pubic rami, to make sure that the entire abdomen is captured and you're not going to miss any pathology. I've included a couple of common artifacts that can complicate interpretation below. On the left is prominent skin folds, particularly here you can see the breasts at the top of the image and a fold caused by excessive abdominal fat at the lower end of the image. If you see a well demarcated line that crosses multiple abdom uh, anatomical regions, pardon me, you should think of it as potentially overlying or underlying. So it could be a skin fold as here, or it could be, for instance, a trouser line or a line from the table beneath the patient. On the right you can see a belly button piercing and often the radiographers will remove these things to try to make the film as artifact free as possible but sometimes things like piercings, buttons from clothing and belts can appear on the x-ray and it's important to comment on them. So now we're going to be looking at some normal patterns of gas and here is an image that shows the large bowel quite well. We can identify it by looking for haustra, which are the mucu mucosal folds of the large bowel and are thick and do not traverse the lumen of the bowel. Large bowel is normally peripherally distributed as well. However, in pathology, for instance, obstruction, where the diameter increases, it can take up the whole film. So a bit of care is required in interpretation when just looking at the distribution alone. Now, 
If we compare the folds of the large bowel to the small bowel, we can see here that the folds are thinner and traverse the diameter of the lumen. These are called valvulae conventes and are seen in the small bowel. They generally become thinner and less frequent as we move from jejunum to ileum. Also, the small bowel tends to have a central distribution, but again, if enlarged, this can change. So now moving on to some pathologies that can be seen in abdominal x-ray and are potentially life-threatening and should not be missed. This radiograph here shows a patient who has had a hollow viscous perforation within the abdomen. Now, for bowel perforations, your primary imaging modality and the more sensitive modality is a erect chest x-ray. However, um, abdominal x-ray does have reasonable sensitivity, but not enough to rule out perforation. Now we look for Riegler's sign or the double wall sign, which is highlighted by yellow arrows in this image. And basically it's a very well demarcated wall that is produced by the fact that there is gas on both sides. So not just the normal intraluminal gas, but also extramural gas. Now, due to the change from a very radiolucent to radio-opaque to radiolucent material, we see the bowel wall very well demarcated. Now, another sign is the football sign, which is caused by massive pneumoperitoneum and is highlighted by the red arrows. And it basically looks like someone's taken a big rugby ball, put it on the tummy and drawn around it, and is caused by gas accumulating at the top of the abdomen. Now, this is seen in massive pneumoperitoneum. If, if you have enough air to produce it, you should have enough air to produce Riegler's sign as well. Another very important pathology not to miss is toxic megacolon, which occurs in inflammatory bowel conditions, so IBD, but also things like C. diff colitis. And it's basically a massive dilated large bowel that can look quite featureless and is due to destruction of the enteric nervous system by the inflammatory process that reduces the intrinsic tone of the gut allowing it to swell and swell and swell and carries with it high risk of perforation and these patients require an urgent surgical review and may likely need a colectomy. Obstruction is another very important thing to look for on an abdo x-ray. Unfortunately, abdo x-rays are only 50% sensitive for acute bowel obstruction. And if, you think, if you're thinking about it, then another imaging modality is very important. However, we do see it on abdo x-rays and we generally use the 369 rule to assess for obstruction. Now, this basically tells you the width at which the bowel is thought to be pathologically distended. So for small bowel, it's three centimetres, large bowel, six centimetres, sigmoid, nine centimetres. And generally the next number up, so for small bowel, six centimetres, suggests a higher risk of perforation. Now you can get larger distension than this if the distension has occurred over a long time and hasn't been rapidly progressive, for instance, in an ileus. And the bowel in these cases has had an opportunity to adapt to the increasing distension. So clinical correlation is key. You can also get special cases called a sentinel loop where there is a localized area of ileus in bowel adjacent to an inflamed organ, such as appendicitis can cause right lower quadrant ileus um, and cholecystitis can cause a right upper quadrant sentinel loop. Now, a specific case of obstruction is volvulus, which is where the bowel has twisted around its mesentery and can become obstructed. And if twists too far, the blood supply can be cut off and the bowel can become infarcted. Now, they talk about coffee bean and kidney bean sign, but rarely does the anatomy follow what you might see in the supermarket. A potentially better way of looking at it is looking at the axis upon which the fold is. 
So for sigmoid, generally we see left lower quadrant to right upper quadrant, as seen in the left hand image with the false hip. And cecal volvulus, you tend to see right lower quadrant to left upper quadrant, as in the left hand image with the drain in situ. Another bowel pathology we can see is called thumb printing, which reflects bowel edema and is seen in any cause of bowel inflammation. And it looks like someone's dipped their thumb in white paint and pressed along the wall of the bowel, as you can see here in this image. Another potential pathology is pneumatosis intestinalis, where bowel necrosis has allowed bacteria that produce gas to enter into the wall. Gas then accumulates and produces this kind of image where we see a line of gas following the path of the bowel wall. Now, what you can see here is very well demarcated haustra, and inside there is something that could be perceived to be stool. However, you can see it pouching in where the haustra are, and that suggests that actually it's the inner layer of a Demeter's bowel that has been pressed out by the gas forming within the wall. Most often seen in necrotizing enterocolitis in neonates, but can be seen in any cause of bowel infarction and can actually also be incidental. So again, clinical correlation is key. Another potential pathology is lead pipe colon in UC, which is caused by chronic inflammation and increased um, growth of the muscularis mucosae, which contracts and generally removes any features from this length of bowel. Moving on from bowel pathology and looking at stones, we can see urological stones on abdo x-ray, but CTKUB should be primary modality for assessing these because we can see things like hydronephrosis and we can differentiate the stones from things called phleboliths, which are calcifications of pelvic veins that can be impossible to distinguish on abdo x-ray alone. Also, if the history is suggestive of renal colic, a CTKUB should be done and abdo x-ray isn't enough to rule out, partly because one of the narrowings of the ureter is as it passes over the pelvic brim. This can be where stones can be trapped and as it overlies the pelvic bone, the stone can be lost. The upper image on the left shows a staghorn calculus, which can be a very impressive feature and is often caused by proteus chronic infection, which produces these struvite stones that have a staghorn appearance as the stone forms in the renal calluses. Gallstones, only 10% of gallstones can be seen on abdo x-ray and these are the ones that have been calcified. When they do appear, they often have a central radiolucency with the calcified brim. On the left, we have something called gallstone ileus, where chronic cholecystitis has eroded into the duodenum, allowing a stone to pass into the gut lumen. It then passes through the bowel until it reaches the ileocecal valve where it becomes trapped, causing small bowel obstruction. And we see Riegler's triad, which is the right iliac fossa stone, signs of small bowel obstruction and signified by the black arrow pneumobilia or air in the biliary tree. On the right image we see porcelain gallbladder where chronic inflammation has led to calcification around the outside. We can also identify some medical devices as incidental findings on abdo x-ray and I've included three of the more common ones here. On the left hand image, we have an aortobiliac stent signified by the yellow arrow. And we can see that the reason why it was put in with the red arrow, which shows the calcified brim of a AAA. In the middle, we have a CBD stent put in for biliary obstruction and also colostectomy clips. Surgical clips are a common finding on abdo x-ray and would suggest a recent procedure in that area. And on the right, we have two ureteric JJ stents, so-called because both ends look like the hook of a J. As I've discussed, you will likely need further imaging and here is a list of some of the things that can also be considered to further investigate any pathology identified. Thank you very much. Here are my references.
Thank you for listening.